Good morning and welcome to Ecclesia Baptist. We are so glad that you have chosen to worship with us today. It is our tradition when we meet face to face that the children start the worship by bringing in our cross and our candle and also um, placing the stole around my neck. Um, so I'm doing that myself, but just know that our children are an important part of the leadership of our church and we miss them, each one of you. And I hope we do have kids watching today um, because a good part of the service today is going to have a great story in it for you. So um, I hope you're watching because you will enjoy this part. Good morning again. May the peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Let us worship God. psalm reading is psalm 13 if you have your bibles and i know that not everyone uses a real live bible anymore but um mine's not alive well the word of god lives so never mind if you use a real live bible paper psalms is in the middle if you use an app it's still in the middle so um i hope that you're using a book a real live book and turn to Psalm 13. Psalms is in the Old Testament of what we call the Christian Bible. And um, Psalm 13 is pretty early on. Psalm 13. Hear the word of the Lord. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I bear pain in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day long? How long? 
shall my enemy be exalted over me. Consider me and answer me, O Lord my God. Give light to my eyes, or I will sleep the sleep of death. And my enemy will say, I have prevailed. My foes will rejoice because I am shaken. But I trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This week, I finished a seminar that I had scheduled for leadership, a leadership seminar with an organization, a local organization. And it was a leadership seminar for people leading religious organizations and nonprofits during COVID, very timely. And one of the things that was brought up this week was how important our stories are, how important our individual stories are, especially in a time of COVID. So for example, your story might be you've been sick all of your life. And so COVID means something different to you than it might mean to someone who's been healthy all of their lives. So the idea was that as we lead people during this crisis time, we keep in mind individual stories. And that got me thinking about our current uh, crisis in the US, which is an ongoing crisis, to um, bring about equity among people of different colored skin. And I began to think about the stories that we each have in our lives. For example, your story might be that people in your family serve in the military. That's just what you do. Your father served, your uncle served, your mother served, your great grandfather served, and, and the military is very important to your family. Your story might be that you've always been Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts. Everybody in your family went through Scouts of some sort, went to the highest level, had the ceremony. It's a big mark of, of a life point for you to be a Scout. Part of my life story is that we are people who pursue education. It is a story that my grandfather began and it was very important to him that his children and sisters and grandchildren and great grandchildren be educated. So it's also very important to my kids. It's just part of our story. Education is important in my story. This is the problem with images that portray a story, perpetuate a story of oppression for people whose ancestors were in bonds, in slavery. This is why it's so important that we help write a new story, that the story that we help create is one of freedom and equity. That's why symbols of racism should be removed, because the story is already written through generations we need to write a new story to help new generations break free from that story. Because you see, we also have negative parts of our story. I have in my ancestry, alcoholism and addiction. My parents chose to write a new story. So that's part of what we do when we as white people of privilege, and not everyone watching fits that um, demographic, but that's why it's important that we help write a new story, because we can, and it's important. So that's what I've learned this week. We come now to our times of prayers of the people, and I confess I did not check the news this morning. I usually do before I uh, start worship, but I did not today. Um, but I do know that COVID continues to ravage our nation and the world. 
we continue to see unparalleled levels of unemployment and um, also remember the children who haven't had a break from living at home and for some of those children school is where they feel most safe and so let us remember families in crisis and families who are trying to cope with this um, new reality also let's remember our local business owners as they try to adjust and find new ways to um, continue to keep their employees on board and to continue to keep the their business alive when you have a chance i hope you will support local business and help them to continue to thrive. Let's also be in prayer for our leaders of our nation as they um, try to navigate this as well. Let's remember that this is confusing for everyone. Um, and let's remember that I, what I've been thinking about a lot lately, with especially with Governor Cooper's announcement in North Carolina that we would not be moving to a different stage of opening, that we would stay where we were for a while. I thought I think about the superintendent when they have to declare a snow day. You know, everybody has an opinion about that. Half of the county. We live, for those of you who are watching online, we live in a county that is very far flung. And so literally five miles down the road from me, they can be covered in snow and I can have not a flake on the ground. And so people are always going, I cannot believe they called a snow day. There's no snow around. And somebody else is saying, I can't believe they didn't call a snow day. Snow day, I'm snowed in up here. And everybody has an opinion. And I think, man, I just don't want to be the superintendent right now making this choice. And I kind of feel that way about our leaders right now, that let's remember to pray for our mayors and our city councilmen and women and our governors and, and all the way up. So let us pray together for our nation, for our world and for the kingdom of God. Let us pray. Loving God, we come now to a time of communal prayer. You, you have taught us through scripture that when we are gathered together and we as a unit lift our prayers up to you, it's different than when we pray alone. We don't understand it, God. We don't pretend to understand your ways, but we are grateful for this opportunity to come now together and say to you, Forgive us, oh God. Forgive us for the ways that we have fallen short while looking at the shortcomings of others. We ask that you would look into our hearts and if you see any wicked way in us, that you would cleanse us, that we could come to worship now clean and ready to hear your word. We confess, O oh God, that we tire of praying for the same thing. And like the psalmist, we cry out, how long, O oh Lord? How long will our nation be shut down? How long will our leaders struggle to find their feet? How long will our loved ones suffer? We grow weary and we forget that our strength is in you. So God, we ask now that you would bring us to the foot of the cross. Help us to feel the moist ground around the cross that is covered with your tears for your people. And here, let us reach out to one another across the miles through your Holy Spirit to lift one another, to hold one another close. There are those whose names weigh heavy on our hearts at this time, oh God, and we lift those names to you asking, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. The family of Dodie Shapiro, 
who passed away from COVID-19 this week, and the parents of Patty Hughes, Boyce and Jean Earnhardt, both who have Alzheimer's disease. Susan Remind, Kayla Swan, Kendall Brackett, The parents of Dana Moore, Chuck and Barbara Butcher. Dave and Karen. Mary Whitaker and Nina Moore. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. Let us pray together as Christ taught us to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, guess what? It's time for the children's story. And today's book, I actually had to buy a new copy, but because the one I had apparently got worn out and lost, but it's a book that my children loved when they were little and it's called Jamaica's Find. Jamaica's Find was written by Juanita Havel and illustrated by Ann Sibley O'Brien. That means Juanita Havel wrote the words and Ann Sibley O'Brien drew the pictures. And here's something I just learned about this book that I have had in my possession, not this one, but another one like it, for 26 years. It was written in the UK. That means it wasn't even set in the US. So this part that you'll see in the story is not even in the US. It's probably in London somewhere. Isn't that cool? So Jamaica's Find by Juanita Havel. When Jamaica arrived at the park, is that there? When Jamaica arrived at the park, there was no one there. It was almost supper time, but she still had a few minutes to play. She sat on a swing and pushed off with her toes. It was fun not to have to watch out for little ones who always ran in front of the swings. Then she climbed up the slide. There was a red woolly hat on the ladder step. Jamaica took it for a ride. She slid down so fast that she fell in the sand and lay flat on her back. When she rolled over to get up, she saw a stuffed dog beside her. It was a cuddly gray dog worn from hugging. All over it were faded stains. Its button nose must have fallen off. There was a round white spot in its place. Two black ears hung from its head. Jamaica put the dog in her bicycle basket. She took the hat to the park office and gave it to the young man at the counter. The first thing her mother said when she came home was, where did the dog come from? The park, I stopped to play on the way home, Jamaica said. I found someone's red hat and I took it to the lost property office. But Jamaica, you should have returned the dog too, said her mother. Then she said, I'm glad you returned the hat. It didn't fit me, Jamaica said. 
Well, maybe the dog doesn't fit you either, her mother said. But I like the dog, she said. Don't put that silly dog on the table, Jamaica's brother said. You don't know where it came from. It isn't very clean, you know, her father said. Not in the kitchen, Jamaica, her mother said. Jamaica took the dog to her room. She could hear her mother say, it probably belongs to a little girl just like Jamaica. After supper, Jamaica went to her room very quietly. She held the dog up and looked at it closely. Then she tossed it on a chair. Jamaica, her mother called from the kitchen. Have you forgotten? It's your turn to dry the dishes. Do I have to, mother? I feel horrid, J Jamaica answer, answered. Which should have been a clue to me that it was not set in the US because I don't know any kids who say horrid, but I digress. Jamaica heard the pans rattle. Then she heard her mother's footsteps. Her mother came in quietly, sat down by Jamaica, and looked at the stuffed dog, which lay alone on the chair. After a while, she put her arms around Jamaica and squeezed her for a long time. Mother, I want to take the dog back to the park, Jamaica said. We'll go first thing in the morning, her mother smiled. Jamaica ran to the park office and plopped the stuffed dog on the counter. Aren't you the girl who gave me the hat last night? You surely do find a lot of things, said the man at the counter. Is that all? You didn't find anything else, did you? No, that's all, said Jamaica. I'm sure some little girl or boy will come in for it today. A nice little dog like that, the young man said. Jamaica ran outside. She didn't feel like playing alone. There was no one else in the park but her mother who sat on a bench. Then Jamaica saw a girl and her mother across the street from the park. Hi, I'm Jamaica, what's your name? She said to the girl. Kristen, she said. Do you wanna climb the jungle gym with me, Kristen? Jamaica said. Yes. Kristen said, but I have to find something first. What did you lose? Said Jamaica. Edgar dog. I brought him with me yesterday and now I can't find him. Kristen answered. Was he kind of gray with black ears? Jamaica couldn't help from shouting, come with me. The young man in the park office looked over the counter at the two girls. Now what have you found? He asked Jamaica. But this time, Jamaica didn't drop anything on the counter. Instead, she smiled her biggest smile. I found the girl who belongs to that stuffed dog, she said. Jamaica was almost as happy as Kristen, who gave Edgar Dog a big welcome back hug. The end. You know, Jamaica made a, a choice didn't she? She made a choice to keep something that she knew wasn't hers, that she knew she could turn in to the lost property office, but she made a choice. And when she did, later on, she felt kind of ashamed of herself. Luckily, she had someone who reminded her that she could change and do something different. And when she did, she felt so much better. And that feeling that she got, was grace. Let's pray. Loving God, I thank you for helping us to live under grace instead of under the law. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
After us. I am grateful uh, for the musical talents of the common hymnal. This is, you've seen several of these videos over the last uh, three months. They are a group of people who've come together to offer music to, I guess, groups like ours. And they offer it for free. The, the chords and everything are online and you can get um, at Common Hymnal on their website, you can get all of their music. And so it's a great website and I think the music is wonderful. So I um, hope you guys will check that out. They have many, many more songs than the ones that I've shared with you. 
Our text today comes from Psalm, uh, that was our previous text. This text comes from the book of Romans. And today we are still in chapter six as we were last week. And this week we're reading the second half of that chapter. Romans chapter six, verses 12 through 26. Hear the word of God. Therefore, do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life and present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law but under grace. What then? Should we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourself to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of righteousness, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you, having once been slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you were entrusted, and that you, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity, and to greater and greater impurity, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness for sanctification. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. So what advantage did you get then from the things of which you are now ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you've been freed from sin and enslaved to God, the advantage you get is sanctification. The end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. I moved my mic. I lost, I got, I got all messed up here. So let me get rearranged. Turkish delight was his favorite candy, but still Edmund had never tasted any this good. He quickly finished the portion that the Queen of Narnia gave him, and now he wanted more. And he could have more. All he had to do was to bring his sisters and brother to the Queen, and she would gladly give him all he wanted. Not only that, but she would make him her prince and later her king. He headed back to get them, just thinking, oh, I just wish I had a little bit more of that Turkish delight for the journey. Listen to C.S. Lewis's words as he explains Edmund's state of mind in this classic tale, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. After he returned to Narnia with Lucy, Susan, and Peter, here's what C.S. Lewis says. He did want Turkish delight and to be a prince and later king and to pay Peter out for calling him a beast. As for what the witch would do to the others, he didn't want her to be particularly nice to them, certainly not to be put on the same level as himself. But he managed to believe or to pretend to believe that she wouldn't do anything very bad to them. Besides, he said to himself, all these people who say nasty things about her are her enemies and probably have those things that aren't even true. She was jolly nice to me. Anyway, much nicer than they are. I expect she's the rightful queen of Narnia anyway. She'll be better than that awful Aslan. At least 
That was the excuse he made up in his own mind for what he was doing. It wasn't a very good excuse, however, for deep down inside, he really knew that the white witch was bad and cruel. See, at that moment, Edmund was the slave to Turkish delight. Turkish delight was his master. For the next several weeks, we will be in the book of Romans. It, as I've said before, is a letter that Paul wrote to the church in Romans, a church that he did not start, but he later visited. Many people have called this letter Paul's masterpiece. And so as we look at the book of Romans over the next, uh, through at least the first of August, I invite you to read the book, the whole book as one, um, every week. You can do that every single week. It's not that long. Um, so I invite you to do that. Today's verses are from chapter six, the second half of the chapter we read last week, and fall in the second section of Paul's letter. I think I will post on our website, by the way, N.T. Wright's outline of Romans that um, I'm using as a guide for these sermons. It's a very helpful outline, and I'll put that on our website. So if you'd like to take a look at that, print it out, keep it handy for the next few weeks, you can do that. So this section, the second section, is when Paul is trying to convey to humanity how to live in Christ and what that means. This is the practical section of his letter. Paul is offering here not just ideas, but actions, what you need to do to live life in Christ. But today's text starts with the word therefore. And so we have to look back because if it starts with therefore, it's related to the text before. And so let's look back at the last of what we read last week. And that is in verses 10 and 11. Um, let's actually go back to nine. Chapter six, verse nine. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin exercise. You're, you're alive to Christ. You're alive to God. So don't let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies. One of the translations I like to look at when I'm preparing sermons is a translation called the voice. And the voice translation says it this way, beginning in verse 12. Don't invite that insufferable tyrant of sin back into your mortal body so you won't become obedient to its destructive desires. Don't offer your bodily members to sin's service as tools of wickedness. Instead, offer your body to God as those who are alive from the dead and devote the parts of your body to God as tools for justice and righteousness in this world. For sin is no longer a tyrant over you. Indeed, you're under grace, not the law. Paul seems to be intentionally focused on the body here. Look at the number of times he uses a word that is body or like the word body. He says in verse 12, um, don't let sin back into your mortal body. And then in verse 13, don't offer your bodily members, offer your body to God. Uh, devote the parts of your body to God as tools. Paul is not talking about ideas here. He's not talking about your brain. He's talking about what you do with your body, not what you think about with your mind. He's not offering you theological um, things to ponder. He's telling you that your body is a part of being a servant to God. It's not just what you think about. It's what you do. And I just... I love this text because I grew up in the South and I have heard many a mama say, 
you better, you better get your hind parts over here. Get your hind parts out of that mess. You better get your behind over here. For some reason in the South, it's always about the hind parts. But for Paul, it was about the whole body. Your body needs to get out of sin and under grace because that's where you belong. It's like he says, look, don't even think about sin. Don't look at it. Don't walk towards it. Don't touch it. You don't have to because hello, grace, you're under it. So get away from sin. And I couldn't help but think about one of my favorite comedians and one of the best skits ever done. Some of you have seen it. If you want to see the skit, you can look on our playlist for today on our YouTube channel. You can also just type in, I think all you have to type in is B-O-B-N-E-W, and it will pop up Bob Newhart, Stop It. It's a fantastic skit. What happens is it's, I think it must have been on like um, Mad TV or Comedy Central or something, I don't know. It wasn't his actual show. It was a skit that he did, but he plays in the skit, a therapist like he did on his long running TV show. His client comes in and he informs her that of the charges and how long the session will be. And she sits down and begins to tell him about her problems. And her problem is that she cannot stop thinking that she could die um, by being buried alive in a box. And she, he asked her, so have you ever been enclosed in a box before? Or no, she hadn't. It's just something she'd started thinking about and now she couldn't stop. And so he says, um, okay, all right. Well, I think I understand what's going on now. I've got the solution. Are, are you ready for it? She goes, oh yeah. She gets out her pen and paper and he says, oh, no, you know, I'm probably not gonna need that because it's just, just two words. And she goes, Oh, okay. So he says, so are you ready? She says, yeah. And he goes, stop it. And she goes, well, but when I think about it, he said, no, no, stop it. She said, but when, when I just imagine what, stop it. This goes on for five or six minutes with everything she brings up. He just says, no, stop it. Stop it. It's very funny. And I think that's what Paul is saying. When people say, oh, but Paul, I really like to stop it. But Paul, you don't understand how hard it is for me. I really stop it. <laughs> if only it were that easy, right? If only it were that easy to give up our version of Turkish delight. Turkish delight, the thing that fills our minds and distracts us from the truth that nothing is sweeter than God's grace. What is the thing for you? What is the thing that distracts you from seeking first the kingdom of God and God's righteousness? Maybe it's fear. Fear of the unknown. Fear of failure. Fear of missing out. Maybe it's a lack of self-love that tells you over and over again that you are not enough. You are not enough. You are not enough and you never will be. Maybe you believe that you are broken, uniquely broken in such a way that while God's love may be sufficient to cover the sins of others, you are special in that way and your brokenness is too much even for God. Maybe you are trapped by addiction and have believed the lie that you can never overcome your dependence. Maybe you feel like a slave to your job, to a failing relationship, to your bank account, to your social media. Paul realizes that sin can feel like enslavement, like bondage, and in today's section, Paul uses the imagery of slavery to make his point. Do not present yourselves as slaves to sin, he says. He goes on to say, and this again is the voice translation, verses 17 and 18. 
thank God that your slavery to sin has ended and you are, and that in your new freedom, you pledged your heartfelt obedience to that teaching which was passed on to you. The beauty of your new situation is this. Now that you are free from sin, you are free to serve a different master, God's redeeming justice. Paul says that since we are under grace's power, we are not just encouraged, but we are bound to seek God's justice. Not the power of sin, but God's justice is what we are called to. We can make different choices. And indeed, we are actually called to make different choices. Now that you don't serve sin, Paul says, get busy serving God. Don't just sit there. Use your body to serve God. See, a life lived under grace is not a lazy, indulged existence. It's a life lived in service and love. If you know the story of the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe, you know that Edmund turns from the witch and rejoins his siblings. Listen to C.S. Lewis's words about that reunion. As soon as they had breakfasted, they all went out, and there they saw Aslan and Edmund walking together in the dewy grass, apart from the rest of the court. There's no need to tell you, and no one ever heard, what Aslan was saying, but it was a conversation which Edmund would never forget. As the others drew nearer, Aslan turned to meet them, bringing Edmund with him. Here is your brother, he said, and there is no need to talk to him about what is past. Edmund, delivered from evil, begins to live a life of service to Aslan. He works for justice. He speaks for those who don't have a voice. He seeks opportunities to honor Aslan, not out of a repayment for the grace he was given, but out of gratitude for deliverance. Oh, one more thing. It's not easy. My sister tells a story about a time when she was talking to our dad about the struggle that she and also I have about getting up early and getting things done. She had in mind a schedule that would have her up at 5.30 in the morning and doing a number of things before she went off to school for the day as a teacher. So she's talking to our dad and, and talking about how hard that is. And so daddy offers some guidance. And she says, oh, no, daddy, that, that's not gonna work. And so he offers more guidance and she goes, daddy, uh, that's just not, uh, uh, that's not gonna get it. And this conversation was last week. No, I'm kidding, it wasn't last week. It was longer than that. And then she said it again, he gave her more advice and she goes, daddy, that's not gonna work. And daddy said, oh, wait, you thought it was gonna be easy. See, just because you're free to live life under grace doesn't mean it's easy. It just means you have the tools that you need to do what God has called you to do. You can choose to pick those tools up and use them or not, but you can pick them up. You can live your life under grace. You can be free. We don't have to be slaves of sin. We are bound by grace. And we can choose to live our lives under grace every day, over and over again, even when it's hard. Let us pray. Oh God, we confess that we don't like to do hard things. 
we really like our Turkish delight. It is so hard to give it up that we forget that we can give it up. It is so hard to believe that we deserve life under grace that we forget that it is ours for the taking. Empower us as you already have. Remind us that our calling is to live for you, to use our voices, our hands, our feet, to build your kingdom on earth, just as your son Jesus Christ taught us to do, to build that kingdom right here on earth, just like it is in heaven. That's our calling. Oh God, help us to remember. Amen. The proclamation of God's word calls for our faithful response. Maybe you are called for the first time to choose to follow Christ. And if that is the choice you have made, we welcome you into our family. Maybe you're called to renew your commitment to Christ. Maybe you want to extend your commitment to Christ to include membership at Ecclesia. Whatever your decision is, we invite you now to ponder what God is calling you to do in response to God's word as we sing our final hymn.
Amen. Thank you so much, Michael, for your grace in providing us these songs every week. You know, Michael is still working in the COVID unit at our local veterans hospital. And so I hope that you are lifting Michael and the Tachinko family in your prayers as he serves there and continues to serve our church each week. So church, we live under grace, not under the law. So remember, you are loved and there is nothing you can do about it. Go in peace to serve God with your whole self. Amen. See you next week. <laughs>